Hello and welcome to the Byzantine Scotist. Today I'm going to be taking a look at um, human law within Francisco Suarez. Um, can people comment just to make sure I'm hearing me well? Um, so Suarez has this very long work called De Legibus, talking about different types of law and the relation of different types of law. And so that's primarily what I'm going to be looking at here. Um, and I want to focus specifically on book three, in the first few chapters of book three of De Legibus, where he discusses the origin of civil government. Because I think there's a lot of confusion on this topic for modern day Catholics. Um, some seem to think there's sort of an absolute monarchist sense that we have to have an absolute monarchy and this was how it was set up by God. Or some people want to go to a sort of Catholic anarchism or they want to simply adopt liberalism. All of these are grasping at some aspects of the Catholic view of the origin of civil government, but they're not getting at the full sense. So that's why I wanted to pull up Suarez here, because I think Suarez has the most developed account of this, and also a good chunk of De Legibus. And all the chapters we need to discuss this topic are translated to English, which is a huge advantage to have. And so I'm mostly going to be looking here at book uh, three, but we're going to take a quick detour at one point to book two. So I'm going to pull it up and just start reading from here. Can people see the text well from this, or should I enlarge it uh, bigger on the screen? I'll start reading, and if you, if uh, can people just tell me in the comments whether or not they can read what I have up here. And so book three on positive human law as such, and as it may be viewed in pure human nature, a phase of law which is also called civil. All right, so we're looking at, all right, people saying it's a bit small. Is that better? You know, I'll, I'll keep going. If, if that's not better, I'll try and make it full screen or something like that. All right. Um, so we're here looking at specifically positive law. So positive law is law that could be some other way, but was set up in a certain way by some authority, right? And so, for example, um, you could argue from the natural law that on a road, there has to be some sort of speed limit. But whether that speed limit be 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, it has to be one of those. And so that's all he means by positive laws, that there has to be some authority to determine that. That's what we're going to get into. And as it may be viewed in pure human nature, um, so that we're not looking at, in this chapter, anything regarding theology. This is all things that are simply known by nature, not by grace. And it's also here called um, civil law. So we're going to be looking at the law of the government or the civil authority. All right, so in the first book, we divided the temporal law into the natural and positive. That's what I just went into. And consequently, since the eternal and the natural temporal law have been discussed, the discussion of the positive temporal law should follow. However, in that very passage, we subdivided this phase into the divine and human. Of these, the divine is in truth the more noble and worthier, but the human is known to us and closer to human nature since it pertains to the same order. Right? So even though the divine law is actually more important, he's going to treat human law first because human law is closer to us uh, in human nature. We can reach it by reason. All right. Um, but also he's pointing out here the divine law is still in some sense a positive law. Because it's something God is setting up. Right? He could have set up, for example, to have a different list than those seven sacraments. He could have picked a different seven sacraments. Uh, but he chose these specific seven. So that's another example of positive law. But that's divine positive law. That's something revealed by God. Here we're looking at those things which are set up by humans. And he says... Um, Accordingly, as the existence of human nature is presupposed for the existence of grace, so human law by its very nature is prior in its order 
um, in the order of its generation to divine law, since the latter is supernatural and relates to the order of grace. Therefore, we shall treat human law before treating divine law. Um, so, right, in order for there to be a order of grace, there first has to be an order of nature, because grace elevates and perfects nature. So in order for God, for example, to give the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments presuppose, first and foremost, that there was already some sort of natural order, because otherwise, right, the, Ten Com the commandment not to steal wouldn't make sense unless physical things to steal actually exist. Um, but on the other hand, we can have and discuss a human law without necessarily reference, without there necessarily having to be a divine law. Um, I, Elijah, I don't know if the book is on Zlib. You can download it online, though. If you just Google Suarez Selections PDF, it will come up as the, the first result, and you can just download it from um, some website that has it up. I don't know what website it is. All right. This as to positive law in its general aspect, apart from any division into human and divine, this is a matter which uh, we need not discuss. From a, for aside from its mode of origin, which is explained in the negative statement that the precept of positive law, whether divine or human, are characterized not by an intrinsic necessity existing in themselves, but a necessity resulting from an extrinsic will, aside from this fact, um, sorry, so they could be some other way. They're not necessary following from the intellect. Rather, there is some extrinsic will, some authority that is making it so that it is a law. Right? So if it's the case of the divine law, it's God willing that there be seven sacraments or there be ten commandments. In the case of um, human law, it's some authority willing that the speed limit on the highway be 60 miles an hour. There has to be someone who wills it. Suarez follows Scotus on this point that law is an act of the will because to command is an act of the will. And even though St. Thomas says it's an act of the intellect, St. Thomas still recognizes that there has to be an act of willing in order for there to be a law simply that there also has to, he emphasizes more the act of intellection that brings it about but both of them would agree it has to be in accord with reason and somebody has to will it it's just the question of which one we're going to emphasize or aside from this fact i say and aside from statements relating to law in general which we made in the first book all right so he already discussed earlier in the first book which we're not going to get into in here um that law is an act of the will Practically nothing remains to be said of a general nature that would be useful as practical doctrine or even possessed of any speculative significance. Moreover, when both the human and the divine branches of positive law have been explained, all the questions pertaining to their mutual accord or discussion or distinction that might call for discussion will have been explained, right? So in order for us to, since grace elevates and perfects nature, in our actual act of explaining the divine law, it will have to also explain how it interacts with human law. Well, we can discuss human law, setting aside for a moment how it interacts with the divine law. Right. And so in a later section, which isn't actually translated from De Legibus, but a parallel passage in his work against King James of England, he discusses the relationship of the divine law to the human law. And I hope in a future stream to get into that, but I'm not going to get into that here. And he says, human law, lex, is divided into that which is common law, use, and that which pertains to the particular law, use, of a single community. However, in the opinion of Justinian, human law, lex, may be divided into that which pertains to common law, use, and that which pertains to particular law, use, of a single community. So why am I reading off the Latin here, and why does the translator bother to leave the Latin behind? Well, if you actually look, there are two different words for law in Latin, lex and use. And use here is I-U-S. So lex is simply tr law. That's all lex means. It's another word for law. Well, use means, it ha use has many different meanings. So use, its origins, is from justitia, which means justice. So properly, justitia, justice, 
is to give each their proper use. So use is the object of justice in the strictest sense. So from this, we can draw a few different meanings of use in practice. Use can be simply another synonym for law, and that's how it's being used in this passage for the most part. It's being used as a synonym for law because justice, of course, relates to law. Um, another translation of use can be the English word right, but not necessarily in the same sense that we discuss rights now. So the primary usage of the word use, as I said earlier, it's the object of justice, right? So for example, the command to honor your father and mother, the child's honor is the father's and mother's use. They have a right, the right is the honor itself, right? If I buy a piece of land, that land is my use, Right. That I now have, I know not so much I have a right to it, but that it itself is my right. Now, this draws out a second meaning of the word use. Use can also be, and this is how we use it now, is in the sense of a subjective right. So a right possessed by the subject. Right. So if I have a, um, if the land that I have bought is my use, then I also have a use to the land, right? So now I have a right to use it. So if I want to use that land to build a house or I want to use it to build a farm, that's my choice so long as it's in accord with the local human law. But if my, the local human law allows me, maybe that's not a good example, there's usually zoning laws, but let's say I want to build uh, my house out of wood, or I want to build it out of stone, right? That is my use because the land itself is my use. So these are two different uses of the concept of right. And we nowadays tend to use a lot more that sense of subjective right. And actually the shift into subjective right, it had already happened earlier. It's present within canon law. It's present in St. Thomas. It's present in quite a number of authors. But by the time of Suarez, the meaning of use as a subjective right is now its primary meaning when it, simple, when it isn't simply being used as a synonym of law. It will actually ultimately be in Thomas Hobbes that Hobbes, this is why I get really annoyed when people think Hobbes is this great traditionalist. You know, Hobbes explicitly says, he says, people confuse the meaning of lex and use. And he says that the only meaning of use is subjective right. And he actually argues that law and right, lex and use, are opposed as, liberty, as bondage to liberty. That all rights are is they give people liberty, according to um, Hobbes, and laws bind people. And so, of course, those two clash with one another. But in the classical tradition, even in Suarez, where he shifted more to a focus on subjective right, the two can't possibly clash because law shapes our conception of justice and the eternal law dictates what justice is. And when we're talking about human law, the natural law is going to dictate what justice is. And then the use, the right, is a particular instantiation of that. And indeed, rights can bind people, right? So if a father um, has the son's honor is his use, that means he has a use to the honor of his son, which means the son then has an obligation to honor his father. So obligation is necessarily connected to right. In order for there to be a right, there has to be a corresponding obligation. There is no such thing in classical conception of rights, of right without a corresponding obligation. And this is the primary issue in Hobbes, is Hobbes makes the two clash. And so as a result now, either there has to be natural laws or natural rights, but there can't be a unified sense of these two. And I think this is where a lot of problems of modern senses of law I think part of the problem probably does go back to the sources where they're very confusing on this. Um, Suarez, I mean, 
ro these come these terms come from Roman law, and the Romans did not have a detailed distinction between lex and use. And canon law in the Middle Ages is just a continuation, really, of Roman law, and so is most of the civil law. And so this issue has to become further refined over the Middle Ages. And now in the late scholastics, they're really trying to refine it to the point where Suarez is now writing dozens and dozens of pages trying to figure out the difference. Um, if people are more interested in this, I highly recommend a recent talk on... Um, the Josias podcast by Potter Edmund Waldstein, who does a really good job going into the meaning of use within classical conceptions, medieval conceptions of law. Um, so anyways, that's the background here. So let me go back over this paragraph now so we can see what Suarez is saying with all of that in mind. So human law, lex, is divided into that which is common law and that which pertains to particular law. And if you see here, use is simply being used really as a synonym of um, law here, right? So the use commune, and I'm not sure what word is underlying particular here, but common law and particular law, calling these use is simply by convention here. I think probably more so than he's trying to contrast it with lex here. But there are other spots where lex is contrasting with use. But I think here it's simply being used as a synonym. So we have human law, and it's being divided into either common law or one per, or a particular law. So common law would apply in all situations. In particular law would apply in only one situation. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe someone in the comments who figure, can figure this out. I'm not sure why he says, however, in the opinion of Justinian. It seems to me Justinian is agreeing with him here. If someone notices something obvious I'm missing here, uh, if you could clarify that in the comments. All right, so he says, the former, that's the common law, relates to the jus gentium, so the law of the nations or the right of the nations and is comprehended within that term. We have already discussed that uh, phase of law sufficiently. And I actually do now want to go back and walk through some of his discussion of the law of nations. It goes on for dozens of pages, so I can only get a part of it here. So let's go back, and I'm just going to look at the key section on page 401, if anyone's following along. So go back to page 401. So in the last chapter... He had justice, or last article, I should say, he has distinguished that the use gentium, the right of the nations or the law of the nations, is not identical to the natural law because it does seem that it is mutable. And he thinks the natural law is immutable. Um, oh, the italics is a summary put in by the editor. Thank you. I don't know how I missed that. Thank you. Um, usually the stuff put in by the editor is in brackets. That's probably why I got a little confused there. All right. So, um, we now have here, let's see here. They also, just to make it clear, the mutability of the natural law, the changeability of the natural law is a disputed issue. So Scotus, for example, following uh, St. Bonaventure and St. Bernard of Clairvaux says that the second table of the Decalogue is mutable, but the first table, that which relates to God, is immutable. Um, Suarez does respond to that there, but I don't want to get into that here as much. So anyways, he says the nat and also he says that animals in some sense participate in the natural law, but animals don't participate within the law of the nations. So the law of the nations, the use gentium, must be something more specific than the natural law. It must be distinct from the natural law. All right, so finally he gets in and clarifies in the second article here what the use gentium actually is. And his example he just gave right before here is um, two ones of sending an ambassador to a foreign country that everyone recognizes an ambassador and the need to be kind to those ambassadors, to not kill ambassadors, to treat, uh, treat them fairly, 
That's recognized by the Youth Gentium. He gives the example of making a contract that everyone recognizes that contracts, so long as they're just, are binding. And um, that there should be freedom of trade so long as there is not... Um, what is it? Um, so long as it's not harmful. And so he's saying that all of these are examples of laws of the nations because they're not specific to one particular country, but they're more general. So I want to read here what he says are the two different forms of the use gentium. So he has the twofold form of the use gentium. For the clear presentation of this point, I shall add that a particular matter, as I infer from Isidore and other jurists and authorities can be subject um, to the use gentium in either one of two ways. First, on the grounds that this is the law which all the various peoples and nations ought to observe in their relations with each other. Secondly, on the ground that it is a body of laws which individual states or kingdoms observe within their own borders, but which is called the use gentium, uh, because the said laws are similar in each instance and are commonly accepted. So, right, so the first way there could be um, a use gentium is in the fact that it is international law. So, for example, the example of ambassadors would be the um, use gentium, that all the nations commonly recognize that you shouldn't harm an ambassador. And then the second one we have here is um, something like contracts that, right, all countries recognize that contracts should exist. And so that would also be a use gentium. There's nothing strictly in the natural law that requires that contracts exist and that governments recognize contracts, but it's commonly recognized as part of the law of the nations. All right. He says, the first interpretation, that's the one of international law, seems, in my opinion, to correspond most properly to the actual use gentium, law of nations, as distinct from the civil law, in accordance with our exposition of the former. The example um, above concerning ambassadors in commercial usage pertain to this first aspect, right? So that you should respect ambassadors and you should allow international trade. Similarly, in my judgment, the law of war, insofar as that law rests upon the power possessed by a given state or supreme monarchy for the punishment, avenging, or reparation of any injury inflicted upon it by another state, would seem to pertain properly to the law of nations, right? So the just war is another aspect of the law of nations. For it is not indispensable by virtue of natural reason alone that the power in question should exist within an injured state since men could have established some other mode of inflicting vengeance or entrusting that power to some third or quasi um, arbitrator with coercive force. Nevertheless, since the mode in question, which is present in practice, is easier and more conformity with nature, it has been adopted by custom and is to that it, the extent it may not be rightfully resisted. Right, so... The same. Uh, the country might not be able, the weaker country might not be able to ensure that they are not unfairly inflicted upon. So there's a commonly recognized idea of just war that all countries have an obligation to follow, that you can't just invade and conquer another country simply because you're more powerful than it. There has to be some sort of injury to do that. All right. He says, in the same class, I place slavery for peoples and nations in their relation to one another put into practice laws regarding slavery, although that institution was not necessary from the standpoint of natural reason. For, as I have said above, another mode of punishment could have been introduced. Under present conditions, however, the law in question exists in such a form that the guilty are bound to submit to the punishment of slavery in accordance with the manner in which that custom has been introduced, while the victors on their side may not justly punish their conquered enemies more severely at the close of the war unless there exists some special ground for punishments which would justify such a course of action. 
And so he's saying that essentially slavery here, it seems, as far as I read it here, seems to suggest an idea of prisoners of war. So he seems to suggest that basically all the nations have agreed that taking conquered people as prisoners of war is in fact um, a just thing to do. And so that's recognized as okay. But he said the nations also could have agreed in some way that that wouldn't have been okay, as I read it here. Uh, I'm not at all an expert in Suarez or law. So if other people think I'm reading a passage wrong, wrong please feel free to drop in the comments if you disagree with my reading. I have people dropping random letters here. Uh, I'm just going to ban that. I'll put in timeout first. If I get a second instance, I'll ban. Just in case people hit random letters by accident. Um, I'm pretty sure those are bots, though. If I see them again, I'll just block. All right, he says... Likewise, treaties of peace and truces may be placed under this head, uh, not insofar as relates to the obligation to observe such treaties after they are made, since this obligation pertains rather to the natural law, but insofar as such treaties should be heeded and not refused when presented in due manner for a reasonable cause. So he's saying here, right, that under natural law, you have a duty to follow a treaty once you have agreed to it, but the laws of the nations have agreed that there that it seems the best situation if we recognize that um, when a treaty is reasonably presented, you should accept it. Suarez is saying that isn't strictly required by nature, but we are obliged since all the nations um, agree to that. Um. For while such compliance is to a greater degree in harmony with natural reason, it appears to be more firmly established by usage itself and by the law of the nations, thus follow, falling under more um, binding obligation. Um, you know, uh, the, there are other examples of the same sort which could be pointed out and expounded, but he focused on w war here and what can be done in war. And the way you um, learn about, right, the use gentium, he's saying, is not simply by reason. The natural law you can reason to, but he's saying the way you learn about the use gentium is basically by being a legal scholar and observing what every country you can get your hands on it does. And if the vast majority of them do one practice, then it's commonly accepted. One clarification I do want to make is he's not talking here about something like the United Nations or something like that. Um, he would probably say that the United Nations could be one possible way the use gentium could be instantiated, right? That if all the nations agree um, in the United Nations to something, that might be a good way to keep track of the use gentium. But he's not strictly saying that the United Nations itself is the use gentium. It's rather the custom of what all nations do that is the use gentium. Right. The rational basis, moreover, of this phase of law consists in the fact that the human race, into however so many peoples and kingdoms it may be divided, always preserves a certain unity, not only as a species, but also a moral and political unity, as it were, enjoined by the natural precept of mutual love and mercy, a precept which applies to all, even strangers of every nation. So he says it's actually part of natural law that all the nations be united and that there be a use gentium. So natural law establishes that there be a use gentium, establishes some of the guidelines, but it does not specifically itself establish it. I do think it's very interesting here, right? He is saying that we have a duty to love all other humans by natural law. This is not so simply something that comes in by the divine law. Therefore, although a given state, commonwealth, or kingdom may constitute a perfect community in itself, um, and by perfect community here, he does not mean a community without flaws, but rather a community whose end is contained within itself. Right. So 
the civil authority, the sovereign state has, um, I'm really curious what word underlies state here. Um, if that is actually status, the Latin word, or that's something like res publica or something else. My guess is it's actually status there, though, because it follows up with commonwealth and kingdom. Um, I should double check the Latin there. I'd be curious. Um, yeah, anyways, um, that right, we have to have some, and as far as is going to show it later on as we get into that in the next section, that there has to be some sort of um, civil authority in order for us to reach our natural end. But our natural end is itself ordered to some sort of supernatural end. And so in that sense, the state is not a perfect society because the church is necessary. Um, Alan Fimister and Thomas Crean treat this well in their book. Um, what's the book? Integralism, a manual of political philosophy. They do a very good job breaking down what it means for something to be a society, what types of societies there are, what it means for there to be a perfect society, and so on. All right. Um, a perfect community in itself, consisting of its own members. Nevertheless, each one of these states is also, in a certain sense, and viewed in relation to the human race, a member of that universal society. For these states, when standing alone, are never so self-sufficient that they do not require some mutual assistance, association, and intercourse at time for their own greater welfare and advantage, but at other times, because also of some moral necessity and need, this is made manifest by actual usage. Right, so he argues against, actually, here, what Aristotle argues for in the... Um, first book of the politics. In the first book of the politics, Aristotle argues that the state, the city, as he calls it, is the perfect society because it has all its ends in itself. But Suarez actually points out, he's saying, can you point me to any society that's ever existed where they didn't need to have any foreign trade or any um, international relations or anything like that? He's saying, no, of course, every society that's ever existed has needed to relate to the societies around them. And so he's saying there's also, as a whole, a human society. And this is why natural law obligates that there be a use gentium. Now he says, Consequently, such communities have, some, have need of some system of law whereby they may be directed and properly ordered with regard to this kind of intercourse and association. And although that guidance is in large measure provided by natural reason, right? so it's by large measure in accord with natural law, it is not sufficient, um, it is not provided in sufficient measure and in a direct manner with respect to all matters, right? So not everything can be clarified through it. We have to have some sort of positive law here. Therefore, it was possible for certain special rules of law to be inter introduced through the practice of these same nations. So it's the regular practice of these nations that establishes it as actually being... Um, the, as actually being the use gentium. This is something that's law by custom. For just as um, one state or province, law is introduced by custom, so among the human race as a whole, it is possible for laws to be introduced by the habitual conduct of the nations. This was the more feasible because the matter comprised within the law in question are very few, very closely related to natural law and most easily deduced th therefrom in a manner so advantageous and in harmony with nature itself that while the derivation of the natural law of the nations from the natural law may not be self-evident, it is, it is not essentially and absolutely requir required for moral rectitude. It is nevertheless quite in accord with nature and universally acceptable for its own sake. Right? So it's still grounded within the natural law. Suarez is not saying you can just make up whatever new laws of nations you want. This is something that's always um, the case by practice. Right? And it's not something, if all the nations had made some error, right? if all the nations had decided that murder was okay, no, murder is still against the natural law, 
So it has to be um, in accord with natural law. It has to be in accord with reason. But in practice, we're not going to see the vast majority of nations ruling things against natural law. Right, and that's international law. So here he has treated how one nation relates to another. And there's also been, I think, kind of quite a bit of sort of the dissident reactionary right, a tendency to want to reject any concept of natural law, or even reject, not natural law, but reject international law, and also to reject especially any concept of um, positive um, international law. But Suarez says, no, there is a concept, a positive international law. This is also affirmed by the magisterium of the church as well. And so national law does indeed exist. We should not be going around saying national, no, uh, international law doesn't exist. As I pointed out earlier, we have a concept of right. We shouldn't say human rights don't exist. The problem is not with international law or human rights themselves. The problem is that they're horribly misunderstood because they have no understanding of Latin or the classical Roman law tradition, which is being explicated here. And those have to be properly understood. And that's why it's so important to go back to a source like Suarez and why I think he's so this work is so important to today. Also, this is not all invented by Suarez. If you notice, he's constantly citing lots of authorities. Suarez is cited all over the place. If you check other manuals from the time, they mostly agree with this. It just Suarez is the most famous and it's also available in English, as I said earlier. The second kind of use gentium embodies certain precepts, usages, and modes of living which do not in themselves and directly relate to all mankind, neither do they have their immediate end, so to speak, the harmonious fellowship and intercourse of all nations with respect to one another. On the contrary, these usages are established in each state by a process of government that is suited to the respective courts of each. Nevertheless, they are of such a nature that, in the possession of similar usages or laws, almost all nations agree with one another, or at least they resemble one another, at times in a generic manner, and at times in a specific, in, in, uh, specifically, so to speak. So he's saying here that use gentium most properly, the word is simply means international law. But it can also mean laws that we see everywhere in practice. So, for example, back to my earlier example of murder, right? We see in every country in human history has outlawed murder. And since every country on earth has outlawed murder, this is an example of the use gentium. And in fact, every nation has also required that murder be punished either with some extreme sort of imprisonment or death or something like that. So it seems that that also is part of the use gentium. Um, there might be something else, for example, that you should show honor to your rulers seems like part of the use gentium. In some countries, punishing your ruler, though, you're criticizing your ruler is punishable by death. On, the, on other countries like ours, it's not even a crime at all. So what punishment should be given for dishonoring your rulers is not part of the use gentium as we see by practice. And so that's what he's saying. It can be either in a generic manner or at times specifically. And he says, this fact may be illustrated, moreover, by means of examples. In the first place, the example of religion mentioned by the um, Eurus Consult, i.e. Justinian, may be adapted to our purpose. First of all, I want to notice, if you notice all these different terms related to law are, de are derived from the word use, right? So who's somebody who studies law? They are a jurist or a eurist. Um, somebody who, if you have a right of authority over something, you have jurisdictio or jurisdiction over it. And the reason the R is popping into these, for people who don't know Latin, um, use, when it's declined into other cases, um, becomes, um, has the actual stem of I-U-R, ur. 
Um, the most obvious example that I think an English speaker would grasp easily is use in the plural is yura. Um, and so the I-U-R is the actual stem of the word use. And so that's why you ha see this here. So um, the URIS consult, I think, is basically the one you consult about law. And the primary standard for what Roman law should look like is, just, is the Codex of Justinian in um, commentary upon Roman law once the Codex of Justinian enters the Latin-speaking world, simply because it was the most systematic treatment of law. You know, he says, so also if you notice, he says the example of religion. Remember, we're treating things by natural law. And remember, when the scholastics seek to prove God, that's part of nature. Aristotle knew God exists. Aristotle only knew about nature. Plato only knew about nature. Plato knew God existed, right? Um, Plato called it the form of the good. Aristotle called it the unmoved mover. Um, and when St. Paul goes to Athens, he says, you know you have an unknown God. And so it has to be monotheistic. The fact it's the religion, it should be monotheistic. That indeed can be known by reason. And likewise, we can know by reason that if a God exists, that that God ought to be honored. Now, this was corrupted in all the different pagan nations into a worship of many different gods, um, in the worship of demons. But the fundamental principle behind it, that there should be a religion, is in fact by natural law. But what natural law doesn't specify is how that religion is done in practice, right? So if we're going to have, before the gospel of Christ, um, what was it? Before the gospel of Christ, there was no way the nations could know exactly how God should be worshipped. Now, I do actually think that there was an original natural religion passed down from Noah to all the different nations. Um, and so there was some sense they had some ideas of how to worship God. But there was quite a bit of room for determination by the civil authorities. And that's what he's going to go into here. Now, once the gospel enters into a society, and this is where we would have to go now to... Um, was it the um, relationship of divine law to human law, right? Once the, the supernatural aspect comes in, at that point, um, what was it? Yeah, at that point, there's now an obligation for the leaders to be baptized. And once the leaders are baptized, as Suarez talks about, they're now subject to the jurisdiction of the church. Now, if they don't choose to be baptized, um, then as a result of that, they now cannot coerce on matters of religion because they have to allow people to follow the true supernatural religion that was now given. And so as a result, the, new, uh, the coming of Christ abrogates this aspect of natural religion for the most part. But there still could be some degree of control by the human. And... As a result of this, then, um, this is really, I think, what Dignitatis Humanae from the Second Vatican Council is talking about, is they're now looking at a world where the nations no longer are recognizing the authority of the church. And if you're not going to recognize the authority of the church, they can't coerce on matters of religion anymore because of the gospel of Christ. And especially now that the gospel has gone out to the entire world in the modern world. Um, versus when popes like Pope Leo XIII were writing, there were still Catholic nations. And so as a result of that, um, they were still addressing those situations and trying to call more nations that were falling away back to this ideal. All right, but Suarez here, as he says, he wants to first treat only that which is known by nature before the divine law. And so here we're looking at a natural religion, uh, which can, that which can be known by reason, before the coming of Christ. But since we don't know how we're going to have to do worship, 
and the worship of God is part of the common good, right? God is the highest good. That's knowable by reason. Uh, that's why Plato called him the form of the good, that there has to be then um, some sort of um, natural, there has to be some sort of determination by the nation. So the use gentium can determine that there should be some sort of natural religion, but we see religion vary among the countries. Uh, yes, Jack, I do think that applies to Orthodox and Protestants as well. Anyone with a valid baptism is subject to the jurisdiction of the church. Um, I will go in in a future stream to Suarez's discussion of this, because he does point out the church has no temporal authority, properly speaking. It has a spiritual authority, which can then exercise coercive members under those subject to its spiritual authority. All right, so now let's go into what Justinian is saying here of natural religion within the use gentium. He says, For the worship of God pertains, in an absolute sense, to the natural law, but the purely particular and specific determination of the details thereof is a matter of for positive divine law. Right? So God has to reveal how we're going to worship him. Well, in the natural order, such specific determination would pertain to civil or private law. Nevertheless, in a certain immediate fashion, the worship of God seems to have been determined by the use gentium. For the custom of conducting this worship through sacrifice is not, absolutely speaking, a matter of natural law, yet almost all nations seem to have agreed on that of that custom, as we have already remarked in treating of that particular subject in an earlier passage of um, De Legibus. Here we go. Uh, and therefore, the said custom may properly be described under the head of use gentium, right? So that we're going to worship God by sacrifice is part of the use gentium. And I think this is because we see Noah offering a sacrifice. And I think Noah passed this down to his sons. And so that's why we see all nations have um, use gentium. All right. Similarly, the fact that there may exist within the state a class of men especially set aside for the worship of God does not seem to be a matter of natural law in the absolute sense, yet it is so in harmony with that law that almost all nations and states have agreed with such an institution, at least in a general manner, however um, widely they differ as to the individual details, so that in this respect also religion may pertain uh, may be said to pertain to the use gentium. So here he's just saying there's widely agreed to be a priestly class as well. In the same manner, apparently, that many of the examples given by Isidore, and Isidore is basically wrote, he was a sixth century saint and he wrote a big encyclopedia about lots of things, but he wrote a section about law. And so this is also a common source by the jurists like um, Suarez. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, come under the use gentium. That is to say, such examples of occupation of places by settlement, matters related to building, those of fortifications and the use of money, and even many private contracts may in the secondary sense be pertain to the use gentium. For example, contracts of purchase and sale and of like nature as engaged in especially by individual nations internally. Under the same head, I would place the matter of post-liminium, um, if indeed there be a real agreement among the nations on that subject. For I've said it seems to relate very closely to civil law. I'm not sure what he means by post-liminium. If anyone knows what that means, drop it below, because I'm curious. Um, but he's saying the fact we build cities, the fact we're going to have buildings, things like that. All nations agree this is what we do, but there's nothing required strictly by natural law that this be the case. With greater reason, I shall therefore classify in the manner the prohibition against um, marriage with persons of alien religion, for in reality, wherever such a restriction exists, it concerns not the general intercourse and fellowship of the human race, but rather the individual interest of the nation in which the prohibition is found. And if indeed there be a great similarity among nations in this matter, an assumption which, in my opinion, is quite doubtful, the said prohibition may reasonably be considered as pertaining to the use gentium. 
right? So he's saying theoretically, if all nations had agreed there shouldn't be interreligious marriage, this would be part of the use gentium. But he actually doubts that this is the case. All right. Now I'm going to go back to his discussion of the use gen of that. So we set aside what the use gentium is. The use gentium it basically means international law, and it's set up by custom, not by um, promulgation, not by specific promulgation by a leader. It's promulgated by custom of habit. It's still a result of the will because people are choosing this to be the case, but it's so in accord with natural reason that it happens to end up being the case. All right, it says, at present, therefore, we are, and we're back on page 416, if anyone's following along. At present, therefore, we are dealing with particular human law of individual communities to which the name positive human law has been applied and which is said to be peculiar to any given state, commonwealth, or similar perfect community. Right, so he's saying anything we apply at any level of government that's set up by some sort of civil authority, that's human law. And he says, and that's human law, properly speaking. So even though the use gentium falls under human law, properly speaking, when we use the word human law most of the time, we mean law set up by some sort of civil authority. Just like when we use the word use gentium, it can mean laws commonly practiced everywhere, but it most properly means international law. Means, all right, so human law is divided into civil and canon. Accordingly, human law of this kind is in turn divided into civil and canon. For though civil, if, for though canon laws itself be capable of being common to the whole world, even as the Catholic Church is universal, nevertheless, in point of fact, it is a law peculiar to the community of the Church of Christ and not common to all the nations since they are not part of the Church. Right? So the Church. It has the divine law it has to follow, but it also sets up canon law as a positive law. The church can change canon law. This is why we should not be citing canon law, which has been abrogated, because the church has the authority to abrogate any canon it would like, which is not required by natural or divine law. And the church is guided also by God, so it will not um, promulgate ecclesiastical laws contrary to the divine or natural laws. Now, the church can make bad judgments and promulgate canons which are not prudent, but um, in order for canon law to be canon law, it has to be in accord with the divine law and the natural law. Um, and he says, right, in theory, the entire world should be subject to the church because all, all people have an obligation once they know about the Catholic faith to be baptized and join the Catholic church. They're not strictly speaking require um, part of the church until they get baptized. And so as a result, canon law is not properly universal because it only applies to this community, even though this community ought to be made universal. As further more in all in the manner of its enactment it is positive human law in the strict sense and a very different character from that of the use gentium well in many respects it bears a likeness to civil law for those two branches of law agree in the fact that they are both in they both in common possess the character of positive human law right so that's actually why we use basically roman law as the guide for canon law because it operates basically like human law if it is human law. One may note, however, that there exists uh, between them a difference consisting in the fact that civil law pertains entirely to the natural order insofar as it regards its origin and authority. For though it is not enacted directly by nature, it is nevertheless enacted through the authority co-natural to man. Canon law, on the other hand, properly speaking, is that law is enacted by man through a supernatural authority. Right, So canon law, even though it's a human law, is part of the order of grace because the church is part of the order of grace. And um, right, he's saying he wants to talk about just the order of nature first. That's all he's treating in this book. Canon law has to be set aside at this point.
because we're only talking about the order of nature. And civil authority can only set up things in accord with the natural law. Therefore, following the order of doctrine and beginning with those points which are easier to comprehend, we deem it advisable to speak of civil law before speaking of canon law. We shall, however, discuss the common basis of, the po of positive human law in connection with civil law. For um, the doctrine will thus be grasped more readily and more easily adapted to canon law by the addition of those elements which befit the latter um, of its supernatural authority, a matter which we shall take up in the following book. So in the next book, which I don't actually think is translated here, but this is just selections from um, De Legibus, he's going to treat the divine law. And so he's saying he's going to deal with canon law more fully there, even if the principles he's discussing here also apply to canon law, because it's still a human law. From the foregoing, it follows that within the civil law itself, two states may be distinguished. One, the civil law in itself, ex simply as it existed among Gentiles and exists now upon upon unbelievers. The other, civil law as it exists when joined with the faith and as it may be practiced among believers in the Christian church. These two differ only in non-essentials, and therefore we shall speak of the civil law in a general sense, right? So everything he's going to be talking about now applies to any government whatsoever, whether it be Catholic or non-Catholic, even if it's explicitly rejected as a Catholic faith, right? In order for it to, grace doesn't abolish nature. Grace perfects and elevates nature. So for something to be part of the principles behind the civil law, um, it has to be in accord with either situation, but, um, it can differ in non-essentials, right? So the actual laws themselves could differ such as, for example, having a concordat with the Pope, um, because you're a, um, Catholic nation. How, oh, you see, uh, my wife joined the chat and is now debating people on video games. <laughs> um... What was it? Yeah, my wife is based, by the way, so everyone knows. Yeah. Lost track. Oh, yeah. So they only differ in non-essentials, and he's just going to speak of it in a general sense. However, when any special point arises calling for explanation, um, we shall not pass it by, but shall adopt the general doctrine to the present state of the church. Based, we're getting Chipotle afterwards. So that's based. <laughs> there we go. Um, right, so he's saying basically he, in this chapter, he's only treating the um, civil law insofar as it relates to the order of nature. But it might be confusing if right, he's writing this obviously to a Catholic audience. It would be confusing if he didn't talk if there was something that might be different because of the relationship of grace. And so he says he will stop and address it if it's necessary. That's all he's saying there. Um, but that then wouldn't apply if a pagan's reading this work. All right, finally, we got through the introduction to this. We are now at 58 minutes and we have finished the introduction. This is a good scholastic work. We've now hit chapter one. I'm almost certainly going to have to break this up into multiple streams here. I don't know how in the world... I am going to get this done in one stream. All right. So I want to go through about like the first four chapters or so of this. And he says, chapter one, does man possess the power to make laws? Right? So he's saying we are going to discuss human law, but of course for human law to exist, there has to, that power has to exist. And so that's what he's going to go into. Yes. We are speaking, as I have said, of man's nature and of his legislative power when viewed in itself. For we are not considering at present the question of whether anything has been added to or taken away from that power through divine law, a matter which will be taken up later. The question under consideration then is as follows. Is it possible, solely, speaking solely with reference to the nature of the case, for men to command other men, binding the latter by man's own laws, right? So what law does? Law binds somebody to it. And so is it fair 
for one man to bind another man to his authority. All right. And he's actually first going to, in good scholastic fashion, set up a series of objections. All right. He says, a reason for doubting they can do so may lie in the fact that man is, by his nature, free and subject to no one, save only to the creator, so that human sovereignty is contrary to the order of nature and involves tyranny. Right? This is essentially the anarchist objection to civil law, that it's unjust for, well, it's one of the anarchist objections to civil law, is that, right, no one is by nature higher than another person. That is, in fact, true. And so doesn't it seem unjust, then, that one man is going to set himself up over another man? And he says, this doubt is confirmed by history, right? And he says that custom, studying the history of these laws, is a good way to know these things. So, he, so this seems to be another issue. He says, this doubt is confirmed by history, for such sovereignty was in point of fact introduced, as it is written, Genesis chapter 10, of Nimrod, he began to be mighty on the earth, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babylon. And that is to say, his kingdom began through force and might. So here we have yet another issue here. First of all, I want to point out, I'm doing my Jimmy Aiken debate in two days. That will be at 9 a.m. Pacific time, uh, noon Eastern time on the Pints with Aquinas channel. Um, the, Suarez, when he wants to know the, about the origin of civil authority, where does he go? He goes to the Bible and says, this is an example we have in the Bible. This is Genesis chapter 10. This is before the Tower of Babel, right? This Nimrod is building the kingdom of Babel. All right. Um, so he takes that as authoritative. Um... Oh, my debate with Jimmy Aiken, it will be on young earth creationism. So whether the first 11 chapters of Genesis are literally history. And I, I'm taking the affirmative. And here's an example of it being used in the affirmative. All right. Similarly, Lucan. Um, Lucan is a Roman author, I'm pretty sure. Um said of Alexander that he was, quote, a fortune freebooter. That meaning, um, right, so he's saying an example of Lucan. Who is Lucan referring to here? I am curious who Lucan is referring to. I'm going to go Google it. Here we go. Lucan. Uh, Lucan is a Roman poet, apparently, according to Wikipedia. Okay, um, he wrote an epic poem about the war between um, Pompey and Julius Caesar. I'm really curious, though, how Alexander pops up in this. Okay, book 10, or it's book, book 4. I'm just, I'm really curious. Probably have to go to the original source. I'm wondering if he's referring to Alexander the Great here. Anyways, it doesn't matter. He's citing a historical example from a Roman source about... Um, how there are tyrants, right? Yes. Um, this is also the meaning of a this was the meaning of Augustine also in his work on the city of God. Um, thus it um right, so Augustine actually says at um one point in the city of God, he says, right, that we have um civil rulers, they seem like they're simply robber barons, right, over the earth. Ken describes them as that, right? He says, what's the difference between these rulers and robbers? Because they go and they simply conquer people, and that's how they became the ruler. And so he's saying, this seems to be an example of, there's unjust cases, and even Augustine agrees. And actually, Murray Rothbard, um, an, a famous anarcho-capitalist, um, cites Augustine on this point of an example of he thinks someone getting close to anarcho-capitalism, even if he knows, of course, Augustine in the end rejects anarchism. Um, thus it is we read in Hosea, O-Z is just the Latin name for Hosea, they have reigned, but not by me. They have been princes, and I knew not. Right, so um, he's saying here that we even have an example in the Bible where there were rulers, but they weren't rulers by, um, what was it? 
um, that these it's God saying these rulers, but they don't ha seem to have the authority to be rulers. That's an example he's setting in Hosea. This, Secondly, the same doubt is confirmed by the words of Augustine, who discusses on the city of uh, and on the city of God, uh, the fact that God said Genesis uh, one twenty six, "Let us make man and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air and the beasts of the whole earth," whereas He did not say, "Let him have dominion over men," a distinction which um, indicates such dominion is not natural to man. Therefore, says Augustine, the first me men were not kings, but sh uh, shepherds of flocks, and they were so called. Thus, Gregory the Great indicates to uh, is Moralia, and um, in the Regula um, Pastoralis, uh, that authority of this kind was introduced through sin and acquired through usurpation. Right? So he's citing here, it seems that Augustine and Pope Gregory the Great, these two great authorities, are also agreeing that governments only exist because of sin. And Suarez wants to defend that they're natural. All right. Thirdly, the doubt may be confirmed by the testimony of a number of passages which show that God alone is the king, uh, the lawgiver, and the lord of men. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our king, the Lord is our lawgiver, Isaiah um, 33, 22. Um, and again, there is one lawgiver and one judge, James 4, 12. All right, so we have yet another objection that the Bible says that God alone is um, the king. Finally, we have this confirmation, namely, there is no true law save which is binding in conscience, but one man cannot bind another in conscience, since this power would seem to be exclusively a property of God, who alone can save and destroy, therefore, etc. There we go. He set up about five different arguments right, um, that we can't have... Um, mankind setting up authority over one another. It can't be because of the fact that humans don't have any authority over another one, that humans um, have in the past set up um, authority only tyrannically and unjustly. Um, Augustine says this is, and Gregory the Great say this is the way uh, government has always been set up. He, said, he says that only God is king, and that since all humans are equal, we can't bind one another consciences. These seem to be really strong arguments against it, right? These are the sorts of arguments. Some of them just any anarchist might make, and other ones Christian anarchists might make, saying that God alone is king, right? You still hear sort of um, no king but Jesus um, type anarchists. Or just, at this point, mention might be made of various errors among the heretics, but it will be better to touch upon those errors later. And he would probably include Christian anarchism among those heresies. He says, the affirmative conclusion, which is a matter of faith, right? This is de fide, he's saying. Um, is it? This has to be the case. All right, I will, as I'm writing this, think of, my, as I'm get going through this, giving my Chipotle order. People in the comments, give me suggestions of what I should have at Chipotle. All right. <laughs> um, all right, so this is a matter of faith. All right, accordingly, um, and it, since it's a matter of faith, he's saying, right, after this argument, you will, as a Catholic, he's saying, not you will be a heretic if you disagree with this. So he's saying that actually thinks anarchy is a heresy here, according to Suarez. Accordingly, leaving them aside, we shall make the following statement. Um, oh no, the um, is it gets to my wife in the comments telling me um what I should get. Yeah, I can't uh no meat today because it's also we had meat fair already. We're now in cheese fair. The Chipotle is just a um, was it um like burrito and taco place. All right. Um, 
um, leaving a uh, side, we shall make the following statement: a civil magistracy um, accompanied by temporal power for human government um, is just and in complete harmony with human nature. Right. So he's saying that there's really nothing um, incompatible, or uh, not only not incompatible with um, what is it? Um, human law and um, was it uh, civil law and human? I totally lost my train of thought here. Is it? Okay, I'll click the chat for a second so I can get back my train of thought. Uh, there's not only nothing incompatible between there being some sort of civil government and human nature. He seems to be saying that actually it's sort of. Not, it is part of the natural law, not merely part of the use gentium, but part of the natural law that there be a civil government. This conclusion is certainly true in a matter of faith. It may be sufficiently proved by the example set by God himself when he established a government of this kind over the Jewish people, first by means of judges, later by means of kings, endowed doubtless with um, princely temporal power and held in such veneration they were even called gods, according to the passage in Psalm um, 81.1 or 81.2 in um, most of the, in, um, the Hebrew counting. God hath stood in the congregation of the gods, and being in the midst of them he judgeth the gods. Uh, I could easily see somebody objecting to the citing of this verse and bringing about, um, what was it? And could easily cite that, um, let's see. Um, the, what was the interpretation of it? Oh, I could use Michael Heiser's interpretation that these are sort of demonic entities instead of civil authorities. But his other points still stand for certain that that's what the Bible says. And that's very much undoubtable. Yeah, yeah it's um some most Byzantine Catholics are on the um, Julian calendar Just going off the chat here for people who aren't following the chat. Uh, most are on the um, Gregorian calendar rather, but some are on the Julian calendar. My parish follows the Gregorian calendar, though. Yeah, can people and so it's currently in um, cheese fair, so we can only have dairy, no meat or fish. But since it's a Wednesday, does can I still have dairy on Wednesday? Can people who know their canon law of Byzantine fasting in the chat let me know whether or not I can get um, sour cream on my burrito today? This is a very important question, probably on par with the philosophy we're discussing here. All right. Um, what was it? Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Uh, nor is there any validity to the objection which may be made um, that those judges and kings had their power from God Himself, for that power nevertheless did not exceed the limit set by nature, even though the mode through which it held was extraordinary and the result of divine providence, and therefore this divine derivation of power in question does not render it impossible for the power to be held justly um, in some other way. Furthermore, from the same contention, there follows this argument, namely that power of that kind is in harmony with nature itself, so far as is necessary um, to the proper government of human community. Um, all right. Yeah. It looks like I'm good to have dairy. It's just a strict fast. Cause I think, um, Julian calendar Easter is about two weeks, one or two weeks later this year. All right. So going back to the actual passage here, sorry for those listening later throughout while talking with the chat. Um, who is it? Um, right. So he's saying that we can know by faith God established civil government under Moses and then under King David and lots of examples in scripture. And God isn't going to establish something contrary to nature. 
And so we can know for certain that the civil government is not contrary to nature. And in fact, that one is essentially saying a Marcionite heretic if they reject this, these arguments. All right. Again, this contention derives fuller confirmation from human custom, right? So here he's going to the use, going to the use gentium. Since kings existed long before the times of which we are speaking, even kings who were holy and praised by scripture, as was Melchizedek, um, Abraham too is thought to have been a king or sovereign prince. And that's clear. He, Abraham has an army. He, when, when he goes to Egypt, Pharaoh recognizes who he is. He's clearly someone well-known in the region because he's a local king. Moreover, a like example is to be found in Job, etc. I thought this was cool that um, Suarez follows the interpretation that Job was a king, um, which I think is definitely correct as well. He says, and finally, in Proverbs, the, gen um, the general statement, um, by me, kings reign, right? So humans, ha governments have their authority. All kings, even ones not directly established by God, have their authority from nature. Um, and, and are in accord with natural law. The point is clearly set forth in the writings of the Holy Fathers, to whom I shall refer in the course of our discussion. So he's also going to appeal to the Church Fathers as well for this. The basic reason for this assertion, the basic reason for this assertion is to be sought in Aristotle's politics. Um, the reason is expounded by St. Thomas, and also by St. John Chrysostom. It is founded, moreover, on, upon two principles. He's going to appeal to reason with Aristotle, and then also appeal to both the scholastics in St. Thomas and the fathers in St. John Chrysostom. The first principle is as follows. Man is a social animal and cherishes a natural desire to live in community. Right? Man naturally is a social animal. Humans don't live out on their own, separate from anyone else. Even a hermit, right, is connected to the church. They're part of a society. They don't exist apart from a society. No human has ever lived apart from a society. As Aristotle says in the politics, he says, if man um, doesn't live in a society, he is either a god or a beast, right? So a god can live on their own. They are all powerful. Um animals can live out on their own, but unless someone's a god or a beast, um, and probably the types of people who are trying to live on their own are not um, gods, and so therefore he's saying they're no different from animals at that point if they live on their own. In this connection, we shall recollect the principle already laid down, that human society is twofold, imperfect or domestic, and perfect or political. Again, right, perfect here does not mean um, that it has no flaws. Perfect means it has its end in itself. So man's natural end can be found within his social relation to others, and that is the civil society. So in the civil society, man finds his end. So naturally considered, the civil society, the state, is a perfect society. Well, domestic, the family that's a natural society, but no family can ever live on their own either. Families are going to have to, at some point, relate to other families, and so it's imperfect. And as Suarez pointed out, even the political society, strictly speaking, isn't perfect because there has to be a relationship between no civil authority, as he pointed out in discussion of the use gentium, has ever existed on its own. They've always had to relate to other nations. So properly speaking, that's to some degree imperfect. And then again, when we go to looking at man himself, man was created as well for a supernatural end. And that supernatural end only exists in the church. So strictly speaking, only the church is a perfect society. But relatively speaking, we can speak the civil society as a perfect society. Of these divisions, the former is in the natural is in the highest degree natural, and so to speak, fundamental, because it arises out of the fellowship of man and wife, without which the human race could not be propagated and preserved. Wherefore it is written, it is not good for man to be alone. All right, so the basis of the civil, even though the um 
family finds its full natural end within the political community, the political community could not live without families, right? Families have to come together and form um, civil authorities. Other families have to come together and form civil societies. From this union, there also follows as a direct consequence the fellowship of children and parents, for the earlier form of union is ordained to the rearing of children, and they require a union and fellowship with their parents, in early life at least, and throughout a long period of time, since otherwise they could not live, uh, nor be fittingly reared, nor receive proper instruction. Right? So in order for them to be raised, um, their physical needs, their moral needs, and their educational needs, these are all cared for by the parents. Kids have to be raised. I think that's self-evident. Uh, furthermore, to these forms of domestic society is presently added a connection based on slavery or servitude in lordship, since, practically speaking, all men require aid and service of other men. All right, so he's saying that any sort of... Um, greater relationship, right? So Aristotle, when he treats slavery, he actually treats that as part of the family, he talks about slaves as being part of the family. Uh, but here I think Suarez is getting at a more general sense, right? That families start to relate to one another. And this is how we're starting to get connection, whether they are in terms of slavery or servitude, if people are even working for one another or lordship. So when he's starting to get to the political authority, this is all on the basis that families are relating to one another. But men require the aid and service of other men. Now, these three forms of connection, there arises the first human community, which is said to be per imperfect from the political standpoint. The family is perfect in itself for the purposes of domestic or economic government, right? So again, relatively speaking, the family is in itself a perfect society um, in terms of domestic or economic government. Um, the economy is always dealt with as the basis of families. That's the fundamental economic unit. Um, because the word um, economia in Greek means um, household management. It's about the management of the equals, which is the family. Or rather, not the family, the household, the same idea there. All right. Um, but this community, as I have in already indicated above, is not self-sufficing, and therefore, from the very nature of the case, there is a further necessity among human beings for a political community consisting at least of a city-state formed by the coalition of another uh, of a number of families, for no family can contain within itself all the offices and arts contained for human life, and much less can it um, suffice for attaining knowledge of all things needing to be known. So they have to form together, at least into a city as Aristotle has, but Suarez is also fine if it's going to be something larger than just the level of a city. And he's saying there's two reasons. First of all, all the offices and arts, right? So there has to be some sort of governmental functions and all the different Arts here, not in the sense of like a painting, but crafts, right? If one family is going to focus on growing food, they can't also fix their house. They can't also do their plumbing, right? Maybe they could do two or three of these, but they can't do everything themselves. They're going to have to come together. And also, if they are trying to do everything, they're definitely not going to be able to know all the knowledge you need to learn as a human. And so they would need education as well. So even though education properly does relate to the domestic level, to get the knowledge for education relates to the political level. And so it does seem then that the political has to give something to the education, but education also should not be entirely taken over by the civil because the civil, um, because education is properly about household management. Now he says, furthermore, if the individual families were divided from one another, peace could scarcely be preserved among men, nor could wrongs be duly averted or avenged. So that Cicero says in De Amicitia, uh, De Amicitia uh, is also a great work if you want to practice your Latin. It's a very good introductory work. It's actually the first work I ever read in Latin. Um, nothing in human affairs is more pleasing to God our sovereign 
that then men should have among themselves an ordered and perfect society, which is called a city state or um, civitas in the Latin, right? So civil authority has to order um, something or else we would just have constant civil war. Moreover, this community may be further augmented, become a kingdom or principality by means of association of many city-states, a form of government which is also very appropriate for mankind, appropriate at least for um, its greater welfare, owing above, to the above stated reasons applied in due proportion, although the element of necessity is not entirely equal in the two cases. So there has to be at least the level of a city, but he does object to Aristotle saying it has to stop at the level of a city. He's saying it's fine if many different civil authorities um, and many different cities form come together and form one sort of kingdom. He's saying that's extremely common. Probably Aristotle was just sort of influenced by his own culture. It was all city states, um, but that's strictly speaking, not necessary. All right. In a perfect community, there must exist necess there must necessarily exist a power governing that community. Right. So now we have our community, but he's now going to show the second principle that we have to have it. The second principle is as follows: In a perfect community, there must necessarily exist a power to which the government of that community pertains. So he shows there is a society. We've already proven that, and now we're going to prove it has to have a head. This principle, indeed, would seem to be proved um, by self-evident truth, for the wise man says, uh, Proverbs 9, 14, uh, 11, 14, rather, where there is no governor, the people shall fall. And so again, appealing to the authority of scripture here, but using it in a sense of reason. Is, but nature is never wanting in essentials, and therefore just as perfect community is agreeable to reason and natural law, so also is the power to govern such a community, without uh, which power there would um, be the greatest confusion therein. Yes, yeah, so it just says it's agreeable to reason and natural law, and so it's not contrary to reason there would be confusion, right? It's one of the reasons that we have civil authority, he's saying, is that um, otherwise there would just be complete chaos. And he's saying, well, we also, there would still be complete chaos in a city unless we had some sort of civil authority guiding it. This argument is confirmed by analogy with every other form of human society, right? So if every form of human society has a head, we better have good reason for the government not to have to have a head. For the union of man and woman, since it is natural, consequently involves a head. The man, according to this passage from uh, Genesis 3.16, thou shalt be under thy husband's power. Thus it is, uh, Paul says, Titus 2.5, let women be subject to their husbands. To this, Jerome adds the words, in accordance with the common law of nature. Similarly, that second relationship of parents and children, uh, in the second relationship of parents and children, the father has over his child a power derived from nature, right? So just in husband and wife, there's a head. If we had children, there's a head. And the third, the relationship of servants and masters. There's Aristotle says that's part of the household. Um, it is clear that a governing power resides in the master, as Paul teaches, um, is it, uh, Tim, uh, I think Titus 2.9 here, and also in Ephesians uh, chapter um, 6, verse 5, um, and uh, to the Colossians 3.22, as he cites a whole bunch of different passages from Paul here, um, yeah, saying that servants ought to be obedient to their lords as to God. Of course, a lot of this here is not very politically correct anymore. Um, but he's saying I mean, all, this all still applies, even if there isn't slavery anymore in our society. And it's probably a good thing it's been abolished, that it would still apply, right, if you have a household servant, that you have to treat that servant who's working for you as part of your household. And the servant has to be obedient to the master, even if it's not necessarily a slave relationship. For though the relationship of servitude is derived not entirely from nature, but rather for, from, 
uh, through human volition. Nevertheless, given the existence of this relationship, subordination and subjection are obligatory by natural law on the grounds of justice. Right. So he's saying that there's nothing in natural law that requires that there be slavery. As we discussed earlier in the stream, slavery is the result of the youth gentium. Once there is slavery, it's a relationship of master and servant. And the relationship of master and servant requires obedience by natural law. So that part is by natural law. I mean, that's because it's on the grounds of justice. Or as we discussed earlier near the beginning of the stream about the relationship between lex and use, use here being right, the servant's obedience is the master's right. And so the master has a right over the servant. A filial subjection, too, is supported by the same natural bond and basis. That is to say, natural origin from which it derives a higher degree of perfection by the title of filial piety. Right? So this is an even more stronger one. Uh, moreover, this point, moreover, is emphatically brought out by the fourth commandment of the Decalogue. Right? So this is an even stronger one because this is in accord entirely with natural law. All right. Hold on here. I should go text my wife my Chipotle order. So I'm going to take a minute break here. I shall read this last paragraph here. Because finally, it follows from all of that, that in a domestic community or family, there exists by the very nature of this case, a suitable power for the government of that family, a power residing principally in the head of the family. Furthermore, the same situation is necessarily found to exist in the case of any community whatsoever that consists of one sole household, even though that community be founded not upon the bound of matrimony, but upon some other kind of human society. Right? So he's saying that in every case we have of a natural society, there's a head. When we have a civil society, um, it has to be it has to have a head as well. Therefore, it is ne likewise necessary in the case of a perfect society that there shall exist some governing power suitable thereto. Probably one could raise that this is a not a like analogy, but they would have to give some reason if every other example has it. People wondering, it's 6.15 by me because I'm on the West Coast of the United States. Hold on, let me go text my order. All right. Here we go. Right, I'll go back to the thing now. Sorry for that quick break there. All right. Going back now to Suarez. Um, here we go, part five. Uh, the reason, so he's now going to articulate the actual 
reason we have to have it. He says, uh, the reason a priori, um, right before we've presented any sort of evidence for it, he says, there is, um, in fine, in fine, I think at last there, an a priori reason for the support uh, of this view, a reason touched upon by St. Thomas in the, uh, in the Opiscula above stated, namely that no body can be preserved unless there remains some principle whose function is to provide for and seek after the common good. Such a principle clearly exists in a natural body and likewise in the political. Right, so his reason is for the the common good, right? And this is the principal difference with later liberal conceptions of government, such as, for example, Hobbes or Locke, right? For Hobbes, the reason we have civil government is that there's a war of one man against another, eternally, essentially. And so we have to set authority over it. There has to be law to bind this right. Um but that's not the primary a priori reason he gives. That is a reason that we cited earlier, but the primary reason he gives for civil authority is because um, it needs to lead the people to the common good. Um, the common good is another complex thing. I'll probably do another stream sometime on the com what is the common good. Um, but just to note, the common good is essentially the flourishing of all of human society. Think of it that way, essentially, right? That we have um, essentially people reaching their end as a common community and not simply as individuals. The common good is singular and indivisible. So um, having lots of roads, for example, that would not itself be the common good. But roads might help provide for the common good by allowing trade. And then allowing trade is going to allow people to uh, meet their needs, which is then going to allow them to act virtuously, which is how they will reach their end of happiness. So governments can do things that help enable the flourishing of the common good. But the common good should not be confused with an aggregate of goods. And neither should the common good be confused with the good of the state itself. Um, the government, right, its purpose here is to lead people to the common good, lead the society as a whole to the common good, not merely for the good of the government itself. All right. The reason for this fact, um, in turn, is also clear. For each individual member has a case for its individual advantages, and these are often opposed to the common good. While furthermore, it occasionally happens that many things are needful for the common good, while this is not thus pertinent for the case of individuals in which, even though at times they may be pertinent, are provided for, not as common, but as private needs. Therefore, in a perfect community, there necessarily exists some public power whose official duty it is to seek after and provide for the common good. So we have here, um, what was it? Yeah, so the first reason is that there might be interests opposed to the common good. So for example, right, it might be, let's say one person has a monopoly on all the food for the society. They would be able to charge exorbitant amounts for that food. And so it might make sense for the civil authority to step in and break up that monopoly for the sake of the common good. Um, they might be opposed. And other times there might be things that are needful for the common good, right? So maybe in our earlier example, it could be that if the government didn't come in and have roads, the roads would all be privatized and plenty of people wouldn't be able to afford going on them and that would hurt business. And so maybe it makes sense for the, there to be public roads that are free. And I want to be clear that none of the examples I'm giving are absolute principles drawn from Suarez here, right? As Suarez says, these are principles in accord with reason that can be, whether the specific laws are principles in accord with reasons. So maybe someone could make the case that privatizing all the roads is in accord with the common good. Um, maybe, for example, they might say that if they're privatized, the people will better care for the roads because they'll have a monetary interest. Well, the government might do a bad job at caring for the roads right now. I don't know what their reason would be. But in theory, right, you can argue it one way or the other. It doesn't mean whatever people want to say is correct. 
but then you can have that argument. What's important here is these a priori philosophical principles that we can draw out from the nature of what of man, that there has to be a people to lead them to the common good. The righteousness of and necessity for civil magistracy are clearly to be deduced from the foregoing, since the term civil magistracy signifies nothing more or less than a man or number of men in whom resides the above-mentioning power of governing a perfect community. For it is manifest that such a power must dwell in men, inasmuch as they are not naturally governed um, in a polity by the angels, nor God himself who acts by the ordinary law through appropriate secondary causes. So that uh, consequently, it is necessary and natural that they should be governed by men. Right, so he's saying that, um, say, um, that the angels don't govern us in a political sense. Uh, and God himself does govern us, but through secondary causes. So God is the primary governor, right? This is where the, these verses in the Bible are. Um, by uh, There is um, only one lawmaker and one judge, but then he also says, by me, kings reign. Right? God is the primary cause of everything in the universe, but God acts through secondary causes. Um, right, because God, when God made the world, he foreknew everything that would happen. He foreknew if he changed the smallest detail, if he bumped one atom, what that, all the changes that would be caused in the rest of human history from the movement of that one atom. And so God does indeed guide providentially, but through secondary causes usually, not primarily by inserting himself directly in. All right. The second conclusion, I hold secondly, that a human magistracy, if it is supreme in its own order, has the power to make laws proper to its sphere, that is to say, civil or human laws, which by the force of natural law may validly and justly establish, provided that the other conditions essential to law be um, observed. All right, so he's saying that our goal here of this chapter is to prove that um, does man possess the power to make laws? He's trying to prove that man has the power to make laws. And so he's saying we first established that there is some civil authority. And now he's saying all human laws is, is those laws promulgated by civil authority. But they have to be in accord with other things. They have to be in accord with the jus gentium, and they have to be in accord with the natural law. And they can't be contrary to the divine law. All right. This conclusion is certainly true and has been moreover laid down by the philosophers, by Aristotle, by Plato, by Cicero, um, so all are, th are sort of three main authorities on natural law uh, from the pagans all agree. The theologians too and other doctors whom I have cited above agree in the conclusion in question. A great deal of support may be drawn from um, Kavaruvius, not sure who he is, but probably another jurist here. Proof of the second conclusion. Moreover, the reason on which the conclusion is based is as follows. A civil magistracy is necessary in the state for its government and regulation. That's the reason we have a civil magistracy, a fact which has already been pointed out. But one of the most necessary acts is the establishment of law, as is evident from what we have said above. Therefore, this legislative power does exist in political magistracy, right? The purpose of the government is to govern and the way it governs is through laws and so if the government didn't have the authority to make laws it would have no purpose for he who is invested with a given office is invested with all the power necessary for fitting the exercise of this office this is a self-evident principle of law right so if you are um given the job or if your boss tells you i need um, you to make a presentation on this for our client. If the boss doesn't give you all the resources you need, or at least you can't access all the resources you need to make that presentation, if you haven't really been given the authority to go make that presentation, you've been given that job because you also have all the resources to do it. And if you don't have all those resources, you're supposed to request them. And so, of course, the civil authority, if it needs to make laws to carry out its duty, will have the authority to make laws. 
a corollary. Whence it follows that such power to make human laws is identified with the human magistracy endowed with supreme jurisdiction in the state. Right. So the power of the magistracy is saying here is, some, is the power for it to make laws. That is its, its purpose and power. This fact is evident what has been said where we showed that the power in question pertains to a perfect jurisdiction. Okay, right. Remember going back to the meaning of, of use here, um, jurisdictio, the underlying Latin word of jurisdiction, is comes from use in dicere, to say. Right? So it's someone who is said to have rights over something. So the civil authority's right is the um, society itself. So they have a right to promulgate laws to bind the acting of the people. Um, that So that entire discussion, which we talked about in, in book one, which I just summarized there, uh, should be applied here. Moreover, it holds in a true in a universal sense. For solely in the prince or supreme magistrate does that public power arise, which is ordained for public action concerning the community as a whole, and includes an efficacious binding and compelling force. Yet this twofold force is essential to law, according to Aristotle, um, the digest, and also the proof adduced above, and therefore only that magistrate who has supreme power in the commonwealth has the power to make human or civil law. Finally, this supreme power is a certain form of dominion, but a form of dominion that calls not for strict servitude as a despot, but rather for civil obedience. It is therefore a dominion of jurisdiction of the point that resides in a, the prince or king. Right? The purpose of the king's promulgation of laws is for the sake of the common good. So they have a duty to obey for the sake of the common good, not for a despot. The king can't simply be ordering people around for his own private good. That is not a licit law, licit use of his power. Um, it has to be a use for the common good. Now, we ourselves are often not set up to judge whether it's for the common good, right? There has to be also the proper system of judging if it's in the common good. And another work of his, his um, treatise to King um, James about the faith, he discusses what you can do in the case of a tyranny. And that's another work I probably won't get to in this live stream. I'm not even going to get through all of what I wanted to in this live stream, I'm sure. And so, um, let's see, I'll cover that in a second or third or however many live streams it takes me to get through everything I want here. All right. Objections to the corollary. Certain jurists, however, qualify these statements, declaring that it is true of the precepts of law, which are commonly applicable or relative to a whole kingdom, but that is not true in the municipal precepts or statutes related to particular communities, a qualification which may be encountered in referring uh, to Philinius, another um, jurist, and to the authorities whom he cites in his commentary. Right, so all he is saying here essentially is if we have another thing, it doesn't have to be directly from the prince, right? So if we have like a um, company, for example, um, a boss can set up rules for the company. The CEO of the company can set up rules. They don't have to go ask the Congress of the, co of the country whether or not they can set up certain rules of um, essentially a code for the business, a uh, code of conduct but they still have to make it in accord with, first of all, the principles of justice, and also in accord with what has been set up as the guidance from the sovereign. Uh, these jurists, right, a jurist is simply one who studies use. Um, these jurists base their opinion upon uh, the contention that many communities not possessing jurisdiction do possess the power to make statutes. Yeah, all right, so there's many other communities that's the same, saying the same thing there. Their argument may be confirmed by the fact that civil law often distinguish jurisdiction from sovereignty. That is to say, from the power of the sovereign to command, as one may gather in the digest. Um, the digest is simply, if I remember correctly, it's referring to Gratian. It's simply a long compilation of canon law. 
Um, but law, properly speaking, is related to the power of sovereign to command and may easily be seen from what is already said regarding the essence of law. And therefore, the power of law is per the power which is per se necessary to law is not the power of jurisdiction, right? So these other things, they wouldn't, strictly speaking, be human law in the strict sense that we're using civil law here. Um, here we go. Um, because, right, we're distinguishing here sovereignty and jurisdiction. So a right, boss has over, a CEO is over their company, a jurisdiction, or a mayor has over their um, town a jurisdiction, but th those jurisdictions are given to them by the sovereign who's the highest authority within the land. And as he's going to go into later, the sovereign can be multiple people. He is not a absolute monarchist. He thinks, as we'll go into in a future section, probably in a future stream, um, he thinks that monarchy is the best form of government, but because of human failing, there needs to be checks on it by the people. All right. But he does think a republic is a totally illicit form of government that one could set up. All right. Nevertheless, the reply is that this qualification is unnecessary unless, perchance, there is some ambiguity in the use of terms. For the arguments above set forth on furnish universal and unqualified proof. St. Thomas makes this clear in the passage where he proves that jurisdiction is necessary in order to pass for the reason that jurisdiction is necessary for law. But a sentence of a particular law also has coercive force, and thus, a fortiori, any law, howsoever particular its character may seem, requires jurisdiction. For no other law um, is ever so particular in character as a sentence, and the latter always has or always um, should have annexed uh, to it uh, some means of coercion, as is evident from the ethics of Aristotle cited above and from the laws already mentioned, since directives without coercive force have no value. Indeed, no one has ever doubted the jurisdiction that jurisdiction is required for the passing of a sentence, and thus our contention is confirmed. For if jurisdiction is necessary for the declaration of law, it is much more necessary for the for making law, of law. So I think what he's saying here is simply that there has to be a um I don't think what he, I think what he's getting at here, I'm not hundred percent certain. If anyone in the comments wants to jump in and clarify it hundred percent, I think what he's trying to get at here is that the, these other authorities wouldn't have strictly the sense of coercive authority that the sovereign would, but I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure what he's getting at here, but it doesn't seem to be the case. All right. So the objections, to the corollary are answered. I guess where he's going to answer it, I guess. As to the fundamental position of the authors in question, the basic assumptions which they make may be denied. For statues um, are either not true laws or else not made without jurisdiction, the points um, which will be accorded to more attention in later passages. Uh, so I think he's saying he's distinguishing statutes and laws here in the strict sense from what I'm getting at. As for the confirmation, insofar as concerns the laws cited in that confirmatory argument, um, I shall point out that, that the term jurisdiction in the full and proper sense refers to political, that is, governmental, power of dominion, the sense which we are here using the word. And jurisdiction, thus interpreted, is included as intrinsically part of political sovereignty in order to distinguish it from tyranny. Such is the argument set forth in the Decretum, in the passage where supreme governmental power of the state is called legitimate sovereignty, and the power and mode of sovereignty will be made in accord with the degree and mode of jurisdiction. So again here, jurisdiction is part of sovereignty, but not all, all sovereignty is jurisdiction, but not all jurisdiction has sovereignty, because there could be a higher jurisdiction to it. Sometimes, to be sure, jurisdiction is strictly understood according to the etymology of the term as signifying the simple power of passing judgment. Okay, so I'm actually wrong on the etymology. I, I missed this part when I was reading over this before the stream. 
I actually got it backwards. So Eurystichio then is the power to say what is law, not the to be said to have power over, which is interesting. So, okay, so jurisdiction is the power to declare a use then, the power to declare law. Um, sometimes, all right, so for law is properly declared or interpreted by means of a sentence. And if one is speaking in this sense, it is not incongruous that the power to judge should be resided in a given person apart from the legislative, although such a person is never without some coercive power, such as would seem to be denoted by the word sovereignty, when the latter also is strictly interpreted. And thus it is, on the other hand, that power given to a magistrate for the punishment of crimes extending even to the death penalty is ordinarily spoken of in the civil law as simply as sovereignty and is apparently treated in the laws above as well as in another, um, the digest. In such cases, moreover, it is customary to give this power the name of unmixed sovereignty, as may be seen by consulting the digest in the gloss, the gloss simply the commentary upon it. All right, so I, I think what he's getting at here, as I understand it, so this passage I'm still a little bit uncertain on, um, but I think what he's getting at here is that they don't have the coer... So maybe it is the case then that a mayor would count as sovereignty, but there seems to be some sense of jurisdiction he's distinguishing here, where one could have jurisdiction, but they cannot coerce the members of it. But he wants to argue sovereignty, which is what uh, can pass law, can coerce its members. And that's the important distinction he's getting at here. Although in point of fact, it is impossible that such a pop sovereignty should exist apart from the power of jurisdiction. As conversely, it is possible for the power of jurisdiction to exist apart from every element of sovereignty. So you have to have at least some parts of sovereignty, obviously, to have jurisdiction. But he's saying there's an unmixed jurisdiction, pure jurisdiction, which is from the um, um, which is from the highest authority alone. This point is brought out in the passage of the Digest, which declares when jurisdiction has been given, a certain element of sovereignty has been given, for there is no jurisdiction without a measure of coercive power. So relatively speaking, these two attributes are separated, not in actual fact, but only in a certain usage of terms, so that the legislative power being, as it is, the power of sovereign command is according one of jurisdiction. Okay, so I think he's saying these two aren't ever really distinct. It's simply that these two refer to different things. Jurisdiction is the being able to make a law versus sovereignty is the power to coerce, but coercion is necessarily part of law. And so any jurisdiction whatsoever is going to have to have some degree of sovereignty. I'm pretty sure that's what he's saying here. I'm sorry for the confusion a little bit on this passage. Probably should have read that passage a bit closer before going live. All right. The objections to the first conclusion are answered. So, right, going back now, all the way to our objections. Here we go. You. There we go. I'm going back about five or six pages now. Oh, we're not even there yet. There we go. The objections are that one man is never higher than another man, and one man therefore cannot bind another man's conscience. And when we do see governments pop up, they're usually started about in unjust ways, and therefore they shouldn't have any authority because they're all just tyrants. All right, let's go back now. Should have kept track of the page number there probably. All right, there we go. The objections to the first conclusion are answered. So it is that, insofar as concerns the reason for doubt, the deductions involved in uh, that reason um, is denied. 
Um, for though man is not created, born, or subject to the power of human prince, he has been born potentially subject, as it were, to that power. Therefore, it is not an opposition to the to uh, pers perceptive natural law that one should be subjected, in fact, even though this subjection is not derived from nature. In fact, on the contrary, it is consonant with natural reason that a human commonwealth should be subjected to some one, although, as we shall see, natural law has not in itself, without the intervention of human will, created political subjection. And so there has to be human intervention um, for us to establish who is that leader. And he's going to explain how that happens in the next chap in the next article, which I'm definitely at this point going to do a separate stream on. And he's going to explain how we end up there. But he's going to say that man is still born with this potential for all the reasons we've said above. All right. You know, he's going to argue that it is merely an accidental quality of human uh, principates that empires have been established tyrannically. With regard to the first confirmation of the doubt, we admit that empires and kingdoms have often been usurped through tyranny and force, but we deny that this is due to the essential na character or nature of such principates, tracing it rather to the abuse of man. Right? So even if the vast majority of governments are set up unjustly, just governments can be set up. And so as a, and we showed above that they can indeed be set up. And so as a result, that's not an objection. All that's an objection to is particular governments, because this is only accidental to the nature of it. Um... Consequently, we furthermore deny that kingdoms were established in this passage from the very beginning, a denial which has already been supported by means of examples, right? So he's already shown the judges were established by God, um, the kings of Israel were established by God, um, that Abraham and Job and Melchizedek had a, had a righteous authority, even if not directly from God. And so there's lots of cases where um, people have authority from God, that we know the authority is from God, and that they are justly rulers. Um, moreover, the words of Hosea, quoted above, uh, referred specifically to the kings of Israel, who were set up without the sanction of God's will, as Ribera explains um, at length when expound expounding this passage. So his argument for this one, um, I don't know if I 100% agree, I'd have to think about it. Um... But he's essentially saying he thinks that the kings of Israel were never licit kings because God established the line of Judah. And so as a result, the, king, the uh, kings of the northern kingdom of Israel never had authority. And since Hosea is preaching to the northern kingdom, that's the case. I don't know if I entirely buy that, but that's definitely a plausible reading. These words may, however, be applied to all tyrants or to all persons who rule unjustly, even though they be true kings, or those who are ambitious to govern, even though they are unworthy and unfitted to do so. Right. So he's saying that um, there could be people who are they're either not good enough to be king, they shouldn't be king, uh, they are king, but they're doing it badly and being tyrannical, they seize this authority. Um this passage that they don't have authority from God applies to all those cases. Tyrants do not have their authority from God, regardless of how they became tyrants. And I would actually argue that I think that that is the correct reading of this passage from Hosea. It does seem some of the kings of Israel seem to have some licit authority within the Bible, and that the prophets do seem to recognize this at times. Uh, but that could be debated. The principle behind it is the same either way. All right. Such persons, indeed, are frequently spoken of, spoken of reigning, um, spoken of as reigning, not by God, and not because they are false kings, but because they rule in a way that fails to accord with God's will, or else for the reason that God permits rather than ordains their elevation to such an office, a point made by origin. Right, so humans could be elevated to an office that God simply permits it, so in which case they don't have God's authority because they're a tyrant, such as right the case of Nimrod with him simply going around unjustly conquering all these peoples. He just sees that God permitted it, he didn't will that he become king because it was unjust. Um, and likewise, 
But unless we have good reason, we should assume that they were established by God, unless we have some reason to doubt their laseity, such as in the case of Nimrod, where we do, because he was doing this through unjust um, war. Or um, that they're, if they're making laws contrary to the natural law, the natural law is itself a participation within the eternal law of God. And so as a result, in human law has to be a specification of the natural law. And so as a result, human law that is contrary to the natural law is contrary to the eternal law of God, and so therefore can't be said to come from God. But if it is a specification of natural law, then that natural law does indeed come from God's eternal law. How long do we have in this section left? Yeah, I'm going to treat this last page and a half here, and then I'm going to cut off the stream. So we'll probably go for about another 15 minutes to a half hour here. All right. Human principates did not originate with nature, but neither are they contrary to nature. So he's going to want to argue, and he's going to go into this in more depth in the next chapter, that human principates, they didn't originate in nature, but that they're not contrary to nature, and so they develop naturally from nature. As the second confirmation that is drawn from Augustine, so right, Augustine was cited that initially humans didn't have civil government, I replied that the passage indicated, um, so it indicates simply that human principates did not originate with nature, but neither are they contrary to nature, right? Because Augustine is citing that initially we see Cain and Abel being, um, what was it? Cain and Abel simply being um, shepherds and so or farmers. And so he's saying it doesn't seem like there's civil government here, right? So... To be sure, Augustine here gives expression to an opinion that the dominion of one man over another is derived by the occasion of sin rather than the primary design of nature. But he is in fact speaking of that form of dominion whose um, concomitants are slavery in a condition of servitude. All right. So he's saying that these cases that Augustine is speaking of are only despotism, not true government ordained for the common good. In, and he's in Augustine here speaking of when Cain went and built a city. And Gregory the Great expresses himself more, more clearly with regard to the governing power, but he should be interpreted as referring to a coercive power and that the exercise thereof, since insofar as directive power is concerned, it would be seem probable that it, um, this existed even among men in the state of innocence. And so we're saying even in before the fall, there seems like there would have been some government. What it would not have been would have been a form of despotism, right? And he says here, this is directive power. So there, so what's brought about by sin is coercive power. Right? There wouldn't be any need for um, Adam to punish his kids for disobeying, they would have simply followed his directive, but it doesn't follow from that, that Adam wouldn't have had an authority. He would have had a directive power, right? So just like, for example, on a football team, and this is, I think, a really good example of the common good. I'm throwing this example here, I think, from Yves Simon. But if you have a football team, um, they need to have a playbook of how they are going to... Um, play their game, right? So they're going to have a coach who's going to decide what's the best strategy for them. Because if everyone on their own decided on the best strategy, there would just be complete chaos and they wouldn't win the game. But it's not as though the win is simply for the players individually or the win is simply for the coach. But the whole team, coach and players, participate within the common good of victory. But this common good of victory is achieved through a directive power. And that would exist, right? Even if players would never disobey the coach, um, you would still need a coach to direct them. And that's what he's getting at here. All right. For hierarchy and a principate exist even among the angels too, as is evident from the scriptures, from the words of Dionysius and from Gregory, right? The angels have a hierarchy. That's what he's getting at. And it, so a hierarchy exists naturally in nature. Moreover, our own preceding arguments may be considered as applicable to the state of innocence, since they are not based upon sin 
or upon any defection from order, but upon the natural disposition of man, the disp disposition to be a social animal and to demand by nature a mode of living in which he dwells in a community, the latter necessarily requiring to be ruled by means of public power. His arguments for the common good, the common good still would have been just the same and just as necessary even without the fall. But coercion, on the other hand, presupposes the existence of a certain amount of defection from order, and therefore, with reference to coercion, it may be said that this power was introduced in consequence of sin. Similarly, a wife's subjection to her husband is also natural, and such subjection would also exist in the state of innocence. Yet it was after the commission of sin that these words were spoken to Eve, Thou shalt be under thy husband's power, the reference being to a proportionate coercive force, as Augustine indicated. And so the wife still would have followed the direction of, of the husband regardless, but there wouldn't have been any coercive aspect in it. Turning to the third confirmation, based upon certain scriptural passages, we reply in these passages, that which is attributed to, attributed to God which is his, but not that denied to men which may be shared among them. Accordingly, Isaiah um, 33, 22, which is what he cited earlier, exhorts people to trust in God and his protection because he holds that God is the true Lord, King, and lawgiver. That is to say, Lord, King, and lawgiver in a superlative and unique sense, whereas God alone has the eternal law. But um, in making such exhortation, he does not exclude that people's right to have its own human king, a king um, in his own proper degree, might also have been Lord. Again, it is possible a similar interpretation to be given to the passage in James, um, chapter 4 and 5, verse 12. Um, concerning the supreme lawgiver and judge, as is indicated by the words, there is one lawgiver and judge uh, that is able to de uh, destroy and to deliver. These attributes would seem to be proper to God. A satisfactory explanation of this passage may indeed be supplied by interpreting the word one as denoting identity rather than a singular. So the sense would be, he who is lawgiver is also judge. Um, nor should the function of judgment be um, usurped by the one who, um, who is not lawgiver and has not the lawgiver powers. Thus, it is St. James adds, um, but who art thou that judgest thy brother? He does not deny then that men can be legislators and can pass judgments, but he does reprove those who would judge rashly and usurp the office of judges in legislatures, right? So it has to be done by a proper authority, and that's what St. James is talking about here. When again, he's saying we have to think about, right, primary and secondary causality. Secondarily, secondary and more immediate to us, the authority legislature creates human laws, but those human laws are made on the base or specific interpretations of the natural law. And the natural law itself simply comes from God's eternal law. So it is God who is ruling, but he rules through secondary causes of human authorities. To the fourth confirmation, we shall reply later in treating an obligation opposed by human law. All right, and there we go. So in the next chapter, he's going to say, um, in what manner does this power to make human law reside directly by the very nature of things, right? Because he said, nature doesn't prescribe who is going to be that authority. So in the next chapter, he's going to go in and look at who that authority actually is and how we determine who that is. Um, but this stream has been running for over two hours at this point, and I think I should probably hop off now. Um, so I'm definitely going to do probably multiple parts to this series. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed this. Um, if you liked this, please um, like, subscribe, comment below, share this with a friend. I think genuine political philosophy, as in this sort of stuff being done by Suarez, is so important for this sort of thing. And so, um, what is it? There needs to be some sort of um, renewal of this. And that's why I think this stuff is important for study. Now, uh, if you also like this, you can support me by going on Patreon. I finally recently got monetized, and there should be Super Chat soon if you want to support this channel. So you can use 
um, super chats to support the channel. You can just watch ads. Just watching the ads supports this channel. And you can also subscribe on Patreon. You can Any amount of money supports the channel. For $5 a month, you get um, ex exclusive access to interviews. Um, for $10 a month, you get one week early access to any sort of exclusive content. I, um, one week or rather it's regular videos. So $5, you get any exclusive content, but you get regular content one week early if you subscribe at the $10 level. And so thank you everyone for watching. And I hope you enjoyed this before I hop off. Someone did ask, um, any books you can recommend on Suarism, um, any intro books. Uh, the work of Thomas Pink has really helped me a lot. Um, more generally, what's helped me, besides just Thomas Pink, because I haven't studied Suarez outside of his writings on law, and just understanding principles of classical law and stepping outside the uh, tradition. I think that um, the Josias has a lot of good material, especially their podcasts. Uh, Pater Edmund Waldstein on their most recent episode did a discussion about the relationship, uh, what the meaning of law, or rather right is within the classical tradition. Um, was it, if you want a good book, um, Integralism, a Manual of Political Philosophy by, um, what's his name? Um, Father Thomas Crean and Dr. Alan Fimister does a very good job of explaining a lot of these principles as well. I have heard the section on law and it is a little bit weaker. Um, I think that's probably correct, but the section on societies and the first, probably the first like three chapters or so where he discusses different types of society, that stuff is really excellent. Uh, he actually draws heavily from Suarez in it. Also the later chapters are very good as well. Um, and we discusses the origin and author an extent of temporal power. And so yeah, that's, those are some good resources. All right, well, thank you everyone for watching. I'm definitely going to do some more parts to this. And so um, I'll talk to you all later.